along to the meeting of the Executive Office. Um, I'd like to welcome uh, the members in the room and also then just that remotely we have uh, George Robinson and Emma Sheeran at the moment and we're expecting Martina Anderson to join us in a few moments. As ever, the uh, uh, meeting is being broadcast and we have inclusions of uh, people remotely through Starleaf today, which is great to have participants along. Um, so as we are uh, court, we can start with apologies and we have received an apology from Trevor Clark. Uh, so thank you to Trevor for that. Um, moving on into the draft minutes that are on page five of the meeting pack. Can I ask members if you are content that that's a true reflection of our meeting from last week? Yep. Yeah. Okay, so with those yeah. signed, we can pass them back over to yourself. Thank you. Uh, in terms of matters arising, maybe just to update members that we had in the past uh, number of weeks written to the chairperson's liaison group and asked that it consider the mechanisms for the coordination of the, of an, the assembly committee to respond to Brexit. Um, the matter was considered at last week's meeting of the chairperson's liaison uh, group and on page three of the table pack there is a copy of the response that has been received from them. Um, it is their view that the, uh, best, uh, the, the committee best placed to lead in carrying out the scrutiny role is and remains ourselves. However, it noted that in order uh, to do this, it may be necessary to increase the staffing resources that are made available. Now, the committee has benefited at this stage from the advice and guidance of the Assembly's uh, EU Affairs Manager. Um, however, it has been limited because of the capacity issues. Essentially, what the committee said was that there wasn't really any one single committee that could take responsibility, and therefore it felt that the Executive Office and its scrutiny role of the Executive Office, which deals with the matter holistically, that this committee was best uh, placed and that it could call on and seek the advice of other committees as it required right throughout um, the whole process. Um, in accepting, uh, moreover, uh, because of the, the way that the potential thoughts of the room were, I said that if it was the case that they expect, you know, that they remained of the belief that it should be our committee, I did think that we needed an additional resource to do it. Um, I don't think that it's fair uh, that anybody suddenly can have sprung upon them an expertise to understand and appreciate all the nuances of Brexit and all the implications, nor build up all the contacts. And given that uh, we do have um, at committee clerk level um, an in, uh, a member of staff, uh, Shauna, as the EU Affairs Manager. I s recommended to the um, Chairperson's Liaison Group that, that, that there might be an opportunity to strengthen the staffing resource for her and the work that she does, and that then we would be able to benefit from leaning on that resource as and when we required. And then if maybe there are more specific issues to do with agriculture, the Agriculture Committee could lean on Shauna and an enhanced uh, staff team there to provide information. And likewise, the Department of Economy could lean on. So if there was an additional resource there um, for uh, that Shauna in that, uh, in that sort of department, that it would be something that we would all be able to sort of manage and that we might be able to tap into that on a regular basis as we would need it. Um, in order maybe just to finalise that, um, there is a letter in the tabled pack. Um, it's uh, on page four of the tabled pack, which is basically right back to the chair of the chairperson's liaison group, just sort of making those points um, that we would like to see an enhanced uh, package for Shauna and her team. Well, she doesn't have a team, but she might get a team that would be able to then be uh, really able to assist us in our work, but also to assist other committees in their work. Would that be agreeable to send that? Are members happy with the content of that or any comments they want to make on that? Uh, I'd be content. Okay, thank you, George. Okay, I'm not hearing any dissent in the room, so I'll take it that we're, we're happy enough. Okay. Um, the committee also was due to hold a strategic planning meeting uh, in around um, sort of Easter time. Uh, and we'd written out to people to ask for their sort of strategic priorities. Uh, and we haven't really had a chance to complete that process. And I suppose, in, in essence, we're heading towards the end of June and into summertime when things will be in a, in a different pace. Uh, but in preparation 
uh, for the committee uh, moving into the autumn period. Um, would it be acceptable if that scrutiny of the uh, Brexit rule of the Executive Office becomes a strategic priority for the committee on the basis that it allows um, certainly the committee clerk and team uh, to be able to, to, uh, to sort of devote time in preparing um, the reports for ourselves and liaison with the department on that issue uh, to be able to keep us up to date and obviously liaison back and forward with Shauna um, and any of the other sectoral interests that there are out there that would be looking for information. Would members be happy enough and content with that? Okay, thank you very much indeed. Um, in terms of the June monitoring round, uh, as you will remember last week we had uh, an oral evidence session from some members in the department and we were told that a written briefing was not provided as the ministers were still considering the proposals. They agreed to provide that written briefing paper once the position was finalised and in time for consideration at today's meeting. Unfortunately, the paper is still under consideration, uh, although returns were to be submitted to the Department of Finance by last Friday. Um, so we maybe shall give a little grace insofar as assuming that that hasn't been submitted by last Friday and that it's still under consideration and that it is uh, currently uh, being considered and decided upon and coming back to ourselves. However, there will be a need for this document Definitely by next week's meeting, because there is a, a session in the House on the 21st of June, around, around about that time, uh, which will require a committee response. And therefore, to have a committee response, we have to discuss it, and to discuss it, we have to see it. So um, we'll maybe hope and that maybe some pressure over the next few days will get that delivered to us for next week. Um, OK, so... If members are happy, we'll move on then to the main part of today's meeting, which is the functioning of government uh, bill, an oral evidence session with the Permanent Secretary at the Executive Office, who is also um, the head of the Northern Ireland Civil Service. On page 11 of the meeting pack are the relevant papers. Um, now, in order to avoid duplication, members will remember at the start of this process, there was a bit of a wrangle as to who, which committee was actually going to deal with the specific item. Um, the decision was taken that the uh, Department of Fi or the Committee of Finance uh, would take the lead on this. However, there are a number of relevant um, there are a number of relevant clauses within the bill that actually refer specifically to the executive office um, and therefore fall within the remit of ourselves. Um, now, we may have particular opinions. Uh, on this bill and how its journey is going to proceed. But I suppose, in essence, we are a legislative assembly and we are to deal with legislation. This is a piece of legislation and it has a number uh, of clauses that directly impact the department that we scrutinise. And I think it is only proper that we give it the fair uh, consideration to make sure that, if nothing else, we have a, uh, you know, that we have a defined committee position on the various elements of it, and notwithstanding that if this uh, bill does go to the House and then is subject to amendments, then we will need to have taken a decision on the substantive clauses in order to determine how we may view or otherwise any amendments that are made during the process as well. Um, so I think it is important that we give the full range of issues our full attention in that. and. Um, as I say, just to remind members and, and with our uh, guests uh, present, and I can welcome David Sterling and Neil Jackson from um, the Executive Office, the process for this is that we will hand over to yourselves to give us a, a short presentation, and then we'll work our way around the room, uh, and in fact our extended room, which includes TV screens and uh, some that are uh, on the Starleaf programme by telephone as well. Uh, then what we can do is we can ask questions and seek some clarification on the clauses and on the uh, remarks that you make yourselves and hopefully we'll have a better understanding of everything by the end of the process. So if everybody's happy, David, I can pass over to yourself then. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to thank you for this opportunity to give evidence to the Committee on the Functioning of Government Miscellaneous Provisions Bill. Um, just a little bit of background from an executive office point of view, obviously the issue of how ministers, special advisors and the civil service operate within government has been a priority for the returning executive. 
Uh, it was a focus for the RHI inquiry, which made a number of recommendations in regard to the role of ministers and special advisers. Uh, these issues were also addressed by the parties as part of the talks that led to the new decade, new approach agreement in January. Uh, the executive has sought to address uh, these issues through a revised ministerial code of conduct, a new code of conduct for special advisers and in the newly produced guidance for ministers. Uh, a new Northern Ireland Civil Service Code of Ethics has also been agreed, which is with trade unions for consultation at the moment. So the executive worked very quickly back in January to put these documents in place once the institutions were restored. And particular agreement of the special advisor codes is one of the first decisions taken by ministers in January. And I just want to emphasise that there's a very clear desire uh, amongst ministers, advisors and the civil service to ensure that the standards to which ministers and advisors and the civil service adhere are as high here as anywhere. So turning to the draft bill, um, the written evidence which I submitted earlier to the committee focused on those provisions of the bill which relate specifically to the Executive Office. Uh, and as I indicated, if the bill is enacted, other provisions such as those relating to the appointment, <coughs> remuneration and discipline of special advisors and record keeping would have to be implemented by this department in line with all other departments. So while I don't want to constrain the Fascinating not being able to see a screen here at the moment. Um, while I don't want to constrain the committee, I'm afraid you, might, you might get a, 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 a Martina's munching a biscuit that we all feel very much part of there, yeah. Martina. Yeah, that, there might be a mute button that might be. <laughs> although it did look like one of the best custard creams that I've seen in quite a while, but enjoy. <laughs> I know. Okay, sorry, go on. No, no, okay. Um, uh, this, is, this is a little uh, less exciting than a custard cream, I have to say. <laughs> Um, but anyway, my, my focus today will be on those provisions which directly affect the First Minister and Deputy First Minister, either by placing limits on their actions or placing certain obligations on them. Uh, and specifically within the draft bill, there are uh, a number of clauses which are of interest. That's clauses 1 to 5 and clause 12. So um, I, if, you, uh, if you like, I can take you through each clause in turn. Uh, are you happy enough to yes, do that? Yes, yeah. Pause after each clause and we'll take questions then. Would that be all right? Or uh, do you want me to go through the whole lot? Probably better if you go through the whole lot and then we'll go around and members can make notes and, and then ask questions maybe in one go at the end of you and give each okay. member five minutes or so with you to go through each. That, that's fine. Yep. This will take a few minutes. So that's okay. That's fine. Minutes. That's fine. So clause one is the amendment of the Civil Service Special Advisors Act, Northern Ireland 2013. Uh, this clause includes a provision in the Special Advisor Code of Conduct to allow a Special Advisor within the Executive Office to exercise certain powers in relation to another Special Advisor. Uh, and this is presumably intended to acknowledge the distinct characteristics of the Executive Office. However, its effect, if it was enacted, would be limited by subsequent provisions in the Bill which propose a reduction in the number of Special Advisors to one each by the First Minister and Deputy First Minister. So if this clause was enacted, realistically, the, you know, uh, such a power could only be exercised in respect of those special advisors appointed by the junior ministers. And at the moment, no such appointments have been made at this time. Uh, clause two then uh, relates to amendment of the Civil Service Commissioners Northern Ireland Order 1999. And clause 2 proposes to amend the Civil Service Commissioner's order to reduce the maximum number of special advisors which the First Minister and Deputy First Minister can appoint from up to three each down to one each. Now, clearly, there's an understandable interest in special advisors, particularly around their recruitment, their role, their management uh, and discipline. Uh, and indeed, in recognition of this, the Executive has agreed and published revised codes for the recruitment of conduct to address a range of issues which emerged during the RHI inquiry. But this clause raises two issues in our view. Firstly, we think it would be inappropriate to seek to determine in law the level of support which ministers should have with no possibility of review in the light of need without recourse to further legislation. Secondly, the proposed measure prompts the question of how many advisers are necessary to provide support to the First Minister and Deputy First Minister, and on what basis that assessment can be made. 
Now, I think we would all recognise that the number of special advisers in the Executive Office has been the subject of comment. However, the very distinct rules of the First Minister and Deputy First Minister make their work, and by extension, the work of their special advisers, wider and more complex than that of other ministers. And when you think about it, the First Minister and Deputy First Minister basically have to go cover the whole remit of the Executive. So certainly the First Minister and Deputy First Minister believe that the current level of support available to them is necessary, and they would see that the proposal in the bill as a measure which it would be a measure which would impose an arbitrary limit which does not recognise the broad remit of their role and responsibilities. And in addition, our written evidence included some comparative figures which suggest that Northern Ireland isn't significantly out of line with the position in other administrations. And the latest, latest figures we have um, advise that in Scotland, they have a first minister and 11 cabinet secretaries, a cabinet secretary is equivalent to a minister. So first minister, 11 cabinet secretaries, and 14 special advisers. In Wales, they have a first minister, eight ministers, and 10 full-time equivalent special advisers. They actually have 12, but 10 full-time equivalents. And here we have First Minister, Deputy First Minister, eight ministers and 14 special advisers. So I'll move on then to Clause 3, which is, would involve the repeal of the Civil Service Commissioner's Amendment Order 2016. Uh, and this would have two effects. First, it would repeal the Civil Service Commissioner's Amendment Order, uh, which allows the First Minister and Deputy First Minister to appoint a person to provide specialist support to them outside the normal requirement for appointment on merit on the basis of fair and open competition. Now, if made, any such appointment is terminated on the date of the next election to the Assembly. So these are time-limited appointments. And indeed, as far as I'm aware, only one appointment has been made under the order in 2016, which ended in March 2017. And no further such appointments have been made now, clearly, the guiding principle for appointments to the civil service is that they should be on merit, and the facility provided by the order is intended to apply only to specialist support that is needed urgently, that cannot be sourced from within the service, is temporary in nature, and words considered that the individual should be subject to ministerial authority as a member of the civil service, rather than drawn, for example, from the consultancy sector. So I think the main question arising, therefore, is whether the facility provided to the First Minister and Deputy First Minister by this order, within the limitations I have just described, compromises the merit principle to such an extent that it justifies its complete abolition. The second effect of Clause 3 is to make the exercise of all the <coughs> powers of the First Minister and Deputy First Minister under Section 23.3 of the Northern Ireland Act 1998 in relation to the Northern Ireland Civil Service and the Commissioner for Public Appointments, subject to the consent of the Assembly. And again, as with Clause 2, this appears to seek to set aside some of the traditional boundaries that we would have seen between the Legislature and the Executive in relation to the management of the administration, including appointments. Uh, clause 4, then, special advisors in the Executive Office. And this clause links back to the previous clauses reducing the number of special advisers to be appointed by the First Minister and Deputy First Minister um, from three each to one each. And its effect would be to make this reduction happen with effect from the 31st of March 2021. I've outlined earlier our reserva reservations about the justifications for such a justification. However, on a practical point, if the Assembly agreed such a reduction, we believe it would be detrimental to the efficient conduct and continuity of business to have this occur at a point well short of the end of the mandate in 2022. So if we were to resume anything like normal business as we emerge from the COVID-19 pandemic, a considerable effort will be required on the part of all elements of this administration across the full range of issues facing us. And I think the sudden removal of the greater part of special advisor support from the First Minister and Deputy First Minister would be unlikely to help in those circumstances. Uh, clause 5, then, is the amendment of the Assembly Members Independent Financial Review and Standards Act 2011. 
This clause extends the remit of the Commissioner for Assembly Standards to include matters concerning ministerial conduct. Uh, the written evidence which I submitted to the Committee sets out our view that any such extension should cover matters relevant to the Pledge of Office, including the Ministerial Code of Conduct and not the Ministerial Code in its entirety. In addition, as I have also indicated, the Executive has decided to adopt another approach to enforcement of ministerial standards, the details and outworkings of which will be taken forward in the coming months. Uh, and I, I will be happy to answer any further questions the Committee have on these aspects of the Bill. Uh, the last clause, then, I think, which is of interest to the Executive Office is Clause 12, which is the biennial report. Uh, and we've noted the proposal in Clause 12 that the First Minister and Deputy First Minister should, every two years, and after consultation with a number of named bodies, lay in the Assembly a report on the functioning of, go of government and bring forward proposals to improve the functioning of government. Uh, performance against targets, I think we would argue, is already provided in departmental reports, and any weaknesses in administration or accountability should already be in the public domain through the reports of, for example, the Northern Ireland Audit Office or through the Ombudsman, uh, and much more, uh, much, for, uh, spoke much more quickly and more readily than at two-year intervals. So I think it's also unlikely to be the case that departments would wait for the publication of a biennial report to introduce measures to address weaknesses in its functioning by legislative or administrative means. So, Chair, um, that concludes my sort of rapid run through uh, the relevant provisions of the bill, and I'm very happy to take any questions you might have, uh, which the committee might wish to raise. Okay, th thank you very much. And I think um, probably just given our uh, approach, it's, it's probably best that you've went through each of the clauses that got, and now each of the members can get a few minutes with you uh, to raise any queries that, sure. that they have. So, I'll make a, a start on that. Um, I suppose it is something that you have already touched on, which is the, um, in essence, the, the the traction that there may be between being a departmental SPAD and the fact that the executive office has oversight across uh, other uh, departments and all the work that cuts across there. Because I mean, it would be fair to note that in 2016 there was quite a, a substantial reduction in the workload of what was then OFM, DFM, into the executive office was quite a number of their responsibilities passed out. Um, given that you were there uh, and in and around in those days, I mean, do you, do you think that then there is that need for that same number of special advisors, given that the responsibilities within the department has reduced? Well, I, I was in the Department of Finance in 2016. But obviously, at that, that was the time that depart departments were restructured, etc. Um, you know, I, I don't think it's for me really to comment on what the appropriate number is. You know, at the moment, there is provision for first minister, deputy first minister, to have four. Mm -hmm. uh, they have decided that three is a sufficient number at the moment. Um, and what I, I think I would say is that you know, as a civil servant working alongside ministers and advisors. They are busy people, and to reduce down to one would push, you know, put quite a considerable burden on that one person. So, you know, I, I'm not going to comment about what the right number is, but you know, I think one would be just too few. Okay, um, and I suppose then maybe that what something that leads in um, to the next is that do you get a sense from your observations that there is, um, and it, it it moves into this realms about the hierarchy of of. Um, spads that obviously within the department if there's more than one within the department then they can create um, a hierarchy but once you extend out uh, into other departments i mean has it your experience been that there is a hierarchy within parties uh, in terms of you know the, the the chief special advisor to the first minister trumps the special advisor to the Minister of X, Y and Z, I mean, and, and how does that work in practice? How do you feel that that connection between the special advisors works? Well, within the executive office, um, if you look at the three advisors that First Minister, Deputy First Minister have, each has got specific roles. Um, we're aware of what those roles are. So if there's a particular issue arises, we would know which advisor to go to. Uh, so in that sense, there's no particular hierarchy. 
and then in terms of the uh, linkages and relationships with other departments, again, um, I, I wouldn't see on a day-to-day -day basis how that always operates. But you know what, you know I do recognise is that special advisors have an important role to play in liaising across departmental boundaries, <coughs> exploring options and ideas with advisors who may be from the same party or who may be from a different party. But again, I don't see any hierarchy you know, being played out there. Okay, I, I'm going to use the old system because it doesn't identify or, or, or cause identity now. But so, you, are you saying that like if, if the special advisor from the OFM DFM went to the special advisor in Decal that and asked for something that there would be no hierarchy if they were from the same party, or there would be that that would be just a request coming in. There would be no sense that hey, this is coming from. The First Minister, I need to get this done, or I'm being advised in a particular way. Everybody still remains independent within their own departments. Um, well, I, I wouldn't see that type of interaction at first hand, and uh, but <coughs> you know, um, clearly, you know, the, the First Minister, every First Minister, have their specific role. Um, how that plays out uh, between departments, I think, will depend on which department is talking to which other department, and what have you. All, all I say at the moment is that um, we have a new executive and uh, it has had to deal with um, a crisis <laughs> the likes of which we probably haven't seen in a hundred years. And my experience has been ministers and advisors across departmental boundaries are working well together. Okay. Are there any gaps in discipline or accountabilities for special advisors? Um, not. Not in my view, you know, again, as I said in my introductory remarks, um, you know, the returning executive placed huge priority on <coughs> addressing the issues that arose and were commented upon in the RHI inquiry report. And they, they gave priority to producing the new ministerial code, special advisors, uh, code of conduct and all the rest. Um, and you know, it's been clear to me um, both sides of the office that both recognise the importance of ensuring that some of the criticisms were levelled in the past cannot be levelled in the future. So, um, mm. I, I, I personally, I haven't seen any gaps at all at the moment. I haven't. I'm not aware of any particular problem. And then maybe on a more um, general issue, because this could be relevant to here or Wales or Scotland or, or Dublin. Um, do you feel that, from from the perspective here of our, our civil service? Do you feel that there is maybe space for an enhanced role uh, for maybe more experts to be involved from the civil service or maybe expert panels from outside? Because sometimes the, the, the difficulty can be that whenever there are decisions that are being taken, um, that there maybe isn't the, the departmental expertise for decisions and therefore special advisors are having to go out and link with other places. Do you think it might be better if that, that expertise could be drafted in to the civil service where we could be having maybe champions or, or um, experts in particular areas if that is a, a priority? I certainly think it's well recognised that that would have been of great benefit uh, maybe within um, environmental and green schemes back a number of years ago, which may have prevented us moving into the what, what happened from the RHI end of things. So do you think there's a space for that? <clears throat> yeah, I think, I think there is. I think the general view in the civil service now, and I think a view that would be shared by ministers uh, as well, is that uh, the civil service uh, doesn't have a monopoly in wisdom. Um, that if you're looking at developing new policies, you know, we should be doing so on the basis of uh, co-design, co-production principles. We should be involving uh, the widest range of interests um, and we should be looking to take in advice, not just from within the civil service, but from all those that have particular expertise. Um, so that, that means you know, working in different ways from which we worked in the past. It means uh, looking to um, academia. It means looking to what um, has been done or learned in other jurisdictions. Uh, it means looking at special interest groups. You know, it means mm. widespread uh, consultation. And you know, we, we have been preoccupied over the last 12 weeks with um, dealing with the pandemic. 
but certainly there has been very good working across boundaries, across the civil service and indeed beyond. And as we uh, come to deal with the, uh, the consequences of the pandemic, it will become all the more important that we continue to work in that way going forward, in other words, in a very collaborative way across departments, but also outside the civil service boundary as well. So I suppose that, that's a long way of saying, yes, there, there is a need for the civil service to engage expertise from a wide range of sources. Okay. Well, thank you. That's, um, thank you for my question. I'm going to pass on now to the Deputy Chair, to Doug. I do. Thank you. Thank you for, um, for, for, for giving us those. Uh, it's interesting. You haven't got long left now, have you? Sorry? You haven't got long left, have you? Do you, you, you finish it? Um, or in work? Plan, the plan was the end of August, but uh, we'd see. Is that, <laughs> oh, right, okay. So I was going to ask you how the recruitment process has gone for your replacements. That kind of says uh, it's probably not. Um, David, can I be a bit really honest? Listening to, you, to your evidence, you, I didn't get a sense of any merit to anything that was in front of us here. I mean, you, you, you were very straight and look, this is what it says, but we don't think that. And I got no merit from it whatsoever. But can I just ask, I mean, if I look at cl Clause 2 and the reduction of SPADs down from 3 to 1, uh, and, and the argument being is, well, you know, the First and Deputy First Ministers are really, really busy and they need to have three because they need to be all over their, their brief. And you're right, they do need to be all over their brief. But surely, because there's eight departments, Surely the SPADs and the ministers in those eight departments are the ones who brief the ministers to make sure they're all over their brief, you know, as opposed to they had to have their own independent three SPADs to be able to get this information. So, so surely there is merit. Maybe the merit is it doesn't have to go from three to one, but maybe the merit is, well, it could actually go from three down to two. Do you, do you see where I'm coming from? And, and the information to get over the brief of um, certain departments should then come from that department. So we're not working in a silo uh, effect, because that's what we're talking about here. If we give the minister three spads, she can work in a silo, and she doesn't have to worry about, um, you know, interacting and working with the with the other um, departments. Um, if I look at the, the the health minister, incredible portfolio, and he manages with one spad. Can, can, do you see any merit in that at all? No, I, I go back to my earlier comments, um, and that is that uh, the. First Minister and Deputy First Minister need to have a clear understanding of what's going on across the executive and that means that they need to have uh, people uh, working at special advisor level who can engage across the departments and you know, my experience is that, uh, as I said earlier, they are very busy people because there is a lot going on and you, know, you, you can argue about whether 432 is the right number but at the moment First Minister and Deputy First Minister have decided that three is the number that they believe is necessary for them. And I don't think it would be right for me to really second guess that. You know, as I say, my observation is that um, it's working pretty well at the moment. No, and, and, and you're right. And I'm not asking you to, I'm, I'm just saying, do, do, would you see the merit in looking at that to be just two or just one? Um, uh, as opposed to they saying, I need three. You know, I'm, I'm trying to look at this as, a, as, a, as a, you know, something that, we look at and say, well, there's evidence to produce the fact that, that we need to have three. <coughs> but actually what we're saying is, well, they want three because they've got a lot to cover. And all, and all I'm suggesting, I'm not saying three is wrong uh, and, and I'm not saying one's right. I'm, I'm not saying two is what we should do because it's middle ground. What I'm saying is, is, a, it, it can, is there no merit in, in finding out why they need to have the number that they feel that they need to have. And, and I, 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 I personally don't buy the fact is that they have to cover all departments. I think. You know, that's why we have SPADs in every department. That's why we have civil servants in every department to be able to back brief and brief as and, as and when required to allow the ministers to, to, to be over um, their brief. But, 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 but I guess, uh, David, I, I mean, you've made the, the, your argument clear and there's no point just sort of regurgitating it. Could you do me a favour, though, just in, in real general terms? Say in Clause 3, could you give me an example of the specialist support that we're talking about in regards to that? Uh, well, I say... It's a provision that was only ever used once, um, and I have had no indication that ministers would be inclined at the moment to use it again. But I think it is something that is there and could prove to be useful at a particular point in time. So um, I don't know, Neil, if your, your memory in the department is longer than mine, I, I don't think it was used other than that one. No, I mean, it, it was used, specifically introduced um, for that. 
purpose or, and has only been used once. I think it goes back to the chairman's uh, question about the need for maybe bringing in expertise of particular type to inform the civil service. Um, for I mean, it is very generally couched to says specialist support, and that could be support of any type. Um, Obviously, in normal circumstances, anybody coming to work within the civil service has to go through the recruitment uh, procedure, which takes quite um, some time. They may not be needed for a long time. And it is a mechanism to provide just such support as the chairman was suggesting uh, in various areas, uh, whether it be science or, or whatever. Um, it, it is a facility is, that, that is there to be used. Yeah. So it provides a flexibility to ministers, which say they've, they've only ever chosen to use on one occasion and again I, I, no indication that they're likely to use it again. Can you remember what that one occasion was? I don't know, just, just for my own point, anyway. It was, it was uh, media. Yeah. The media. David Gordon. Yeah. David Gordon. Uh, and what was, that, what was it for? Uh, it was, I can't remember the exact title, but it was communications and media support or advice. Right. And do we not, and, 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 I remember that actually, and that felt like an abuse because we had so many communications people working for the executive at the time that we brought David Gordon in to be the top communications guy. I'm not saying it wasn't abuse. It was, um, I, again, I, I suppose I'm going back to this this, this point: is that, that you kind of see no merit in it, and I see merit in this. I, you know that you know that there is merit in saying, well, actually, they, they don't need that because there needs to be another mechanism when they need to bring somebody in. That there's a scrutiny as to who they're bringing in and why they're bringing them in. And I'm not saying David Gordon was wrong to bring him in, but there should have been a scrutiny process before he was brought in. And this <coughs> stops that scrutiny process, because he can come in under somebody just says, I want him in. Um, uh, and so therefore, I do see, I see merit on that. Um, uh, and if I can, I mean, just, just very briefly then, if I, and I can, I'm trying to get a sense of, of where, where we see some merit in this, as opposed to saying, well, let's just throw this away. Um, why would you not think that the Assembly Commissioner for Standards would be a good person to look at um, the, the issues in regards to the Ministerial Code? Oh, I think the concern would be the Ministerial Code has got three sections to it. The first um, covers the Pledge of Office, uh, the Ministerial Code of Conduct and the seven principles of public life. I think what we've said is there's a legitimate interest for the uh, commissioner in that area. Uh, the second um, section is in relation to the, exec the workings of the executive committee. And the third section is uh, in relation to the North South Ministerial Council and the British Irish Council. And I think if you were to extend the remit of the commissioner to the ministerial code in its entirety, it could potentially involve him or her in functional matters relating to the operation of the executive committee, the NSMC or the BIC, which in themselves wouldn't normally be regarded as issues of conduct or matters of conduct. So I think that's why we're saying legitimate rules in relation to section one, but there are no conduct issues in relation to sections two and three. I think that's that broadly the that's right. Yeah. right. But, but, but is there a worth to have the Commissioner involved for, and, and it says here, and to give advice on any matter of general principle relating to the standards of the conduct of the members of the Assembly, including Ministers? So that, for example, um, we could be asking him to look at why we are withholding emails uh, from the Department for Finance in regards to PPE from the 30th and the 31st uh, of March. So he could be looking at that for us. Because it's general interest, and I'm, I'm saying that because it's general interest. That's a general interest point. I could get a commissioner to say, look, that's a general interest. Do we look into that? Why are we withholding, uh, in this world of transparency, why are we withholding these emails which, in regards to PPE? Um, without wanting to get into specific issues, but I think what you would need to do is you need to look and, and, and to see what existing arrangements there are to deal with um, uh, any concerns that are expressed. Like, for example, if you're talking about uh, data yeah. uh, and the release of data, we have an information commissioner. Uh, if you're looking at issues in and around value for money, we've got the controller and auditor general. Uh, if you're looking at issues in and around potential maladministration, we have the ombudsman. So, you know, there are a range of people in place 
that are there to look at this sort of thing. So I think just uh, you know, it'll all be for the assembly to decide what they want to do in relation yeah. to this bill. But I, I'm just pointing out some of the issues that. Uh, we, we would recognise within the executive office. And, and of course, David, and, and, again, and again, all I'm trying to do is trying to find the merit in this because we've overlooked merit that's in here in front of us now, and, and that's what it is. That's just the sense I got from the evidence you gave, David, that, that, that there didn't seem to be anybody looking at what is the merit in this, and, I, and I'm trying to do that um, here for, for, from this chair. And, and I'll just say to the chair, I mean, I'm a member of the Standards and Privilege Committee, we have links to the, the Commissioner just in case there is a, a, a conflict of interest. David, listen, thank, thank you for that. Um, uh, sorry if I got into the weeds a little bit, but I'm just trying to really sort of pick it, pick it that a little bit. But thank you, thank you, Chair. Can't explain your deep knowledge of those questions and being a member of that committee. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Trevor. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, just going back to the David Gordon situation, um, my, my recollection, I think, would be that, that David was brought in to sort of beef up the communications output. Of the OFM DFM at that time, and he was perhaps to be more public facing than rather than backroom. And whether it worked or not would be open to question, but uh, he wasn't there for very long. And um, but it, it, that's just an observation, really. I mean, it, it, it seems to me if you look at all the various crises we have undergone and we're still undergoing at the present time. I can certainly see virtue in allowing OFM DFM to bring in specialist support, and if it's urgent, to do it without having to go through the normal appointment procedure, which can take an awful long time. So, uh, what do you think about that? I mean, uh, I shouldn't maybe be asking you for an opinion, but it does seem to me that there's there's some merit in allowing well, uh, executive office now some latitude, in particular extreme circumstances, which actually could, have, could apply to other departments as well, particularly health at the moment. Well, I think, as, as I said before, the current provision provides a flexibility to ministers. The bill if enacted in the way that it's drafted would actually remove that flexibility. Yeah, I'm disagreeing with the bill here. <laughs> Um, I, I don't think it'd be right for me to comment on right. specific issues on the occasion at yeah. which it was used before. Okay, the, um, going back to the number of advisors in general, uh, three to one. Um, I think Doug's provisional suggestion should be down to two as, as the obvious um, way forward, perhaps. But I don't know the number of advisors that OFM DFM would actually need. Uh, uh, but in other jurisdictions or in our history, would, would junior ministers qualify for an, a special advisor of their own? I think uh, the same. previously the junior ministers did have a special advisor yeah. each, and uh, that the ju junior ministers currently don't have a special advisor. Yeah. So, I mean, you'd have to think if, if junior ministers are worth their salt, that they would need to have the same facilities as their political masters, in other words, have their own special advisor, or else share too with their, with their particular minister. Uh, one does seem very, very tight, um, although I think Doug said as well, or perhaps as the chair, that uh, when, when you look at the situation around health at the moment, the size and the responsibility of that department, that one would, would seem to be particularly mean as other departments might get away with one quite happily. So it's been a, it's, it's up for discussion, really, isn't it? It's, uh, it's not straightforward. The, um, you, you, you refer to the number of advisors in other jurisdictions. It, it depends how you compare them, doesn't it? <laughs> if you go by the number of departments, uh, that's fair enough. Um, if you go by population size, or if you go by responsibilities that the other jurisdictions would have that we don't have, such as tax raising. Um, I, I still think our, our number overall at 14 at the present time um, stands out as being excessive compared to particularly Wales and Scotland. I mean, how, 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 do, you, how do you justify... That's a judgment, obviously. Yeah, I yeah, know, but, but you, you, you have tried to justify, the, in your opinion, I think you said that there's no standout differences between the, the three jurisdictions, that they're, they're pretty much 
in, in balance as regards the number of personnel regard, uh, against the, the amount of responsibility? I, I'm kind of query that. You know. Well, I, I think I was just making the point that you know, if you look at br broadly 14 is the number that all three jurisdictions have. Uh, sorry, it's uh, 12 in Wales, isn't it? No way. 10. 10. Um, 12 full-time equivalent. 12 full-time equivalent. Um, yeah, look, there's all sorts of ways in which you can make comparisons, you know, population size. You know, I, I, I could argue that actually Wales would have fewer powers dev devolved to them from the Westminster government than we have here. So, you know, there are all sorts of things which mean that strict, precise comparisons can be oh, yeah. um, a little yeah. I, think, I think originally you said 10 full-time equivalent, is that right, for Wales? I think that was the previous figure, David, is 12, I think. It was yeah, the one. sure. I, yeah. I wrote it down here, I thought it was 10. Yeah, no, it was Scotland, 14, um, Wales, uh, 12 full-time equivalents, 12, okay. and Northern yeah. Ireland, 14. <coughs> Well, fair enough. I haven't really asked you questions. I've, I've put suggestions out here, so I'll, I'll leave it at that because we, we have to discuss that, obviously. Thanks. Okay, um, next, Christopher. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, does similar legislation to this pertain anywhere else in the United Kingdom or in the Republic? Not to my knowledge, I don't think. Uh, no, uh, this, this civil service in uh, the Home Civil Service, it's so-called, is um, set up in statute. Yeah. It has a separate um, sort of statutory identity with its own uh, legislation, so there uh, would be nothing equivalent to this, uh, that, to our knowledge, yeah. Okay. Um, in terms of the, the content, um, and sort of picking up from the point that the Deputy Chair of the Committee made, what positive aspects do you see from the implementation of this legislation in relation to the smooth governance Northern Ireland? Um, again, I think that's a difficult question for me to answer, you know, because um, uh, clearly uh, what, what I sort of feel I can do here today is point up some of the issues that would arise if the legislation was enacted as currently drafted. <coughs> um, I, I haven't sat down and looked at it in terms of, you know, what would its overall impact be positively and negatively? So it would be a difficult question for me to answer. I mean, it's a profoundly political piece of legislation that arises <coughs> out of a profoundly political situation. I understand that, and you're a civil servant, not a politician. But is there anything in it that you see, from a, strictly from a civil service perspective, I'm not intending to get into numbers of SPADs or any of the stuff that has made headlines in the past, Purely from a civil service perspective, is there anything that stands out to you that you see? Oh, you know, that would make a thing that would fix a problem that we previously had, or that will address a situation that has caused difficulty. That's a good element of, of that legislation. Is there anything there that you see of um, particular advantage being legislated for and included in legislation? Um, I this sounds as if I'm ducking the question, but I would need to go back and look at the full. You know, I, I, my, my focus is coming no, today. The no, don't worry about it. Yeah, <laughs> well, there's nothing I could say to you now that um, uh, you know w would address a particular problem that isn't being addressed at the moment with the current regulations, guidance, and all the rest. And, and I also think it, it doesn't actually materially change the situation in terms of what is there. There will still be special advisors. There will still be appointments made. What it is doing is uh, placing controls on the exercise of those functions and restricting numbers. But overall, it actually doesn't change, you know, how the system Your operates day -day at the moment. Life will not. There is a consequence of yeah. Okay. Um, well, other than that, in some other provisions, um, you know, certain things would be criminalised, which again. Um, we would not see in any other jurisdiction <coughs> we're aware of, um, and I think would create some uh, real practical difficulties in just the operation of government. But Did you speak to that for me? Um, I, knew, I knew you were going to ask that. I, I didn't prepare for that today because they weren't directly relevant to this. I don't know. Do you want to comment? What's it, sorry? This was the um, 
the issues that would uh, introduce criminal sanctions for certain breaches. Um, oh, this is around uh, sort of um, prison sentences, etc., for not um, filing or taking records of meetings and, and keeping proper records management systems, um, which seems possibly unduly punitive. I think the Department of Justice submitted evidence to the <laughs> Finance Committee suggesting that some of those um, provisions would be excessive. Okay, um, just in terms of, so I've asked in terms of positive aspects, in terms of, in relation to how this place is governed, um, the clauses that we're considering here, the practical day to day negative aspects, be. if you can give me um, some sort of idea in terms of, you know, just if you're trying to run a government department and this, either as a minister or a civil servant, and this becomes law, what are the, the impediments that it may potentially create for you in your day-to-day -day existence doing that? Well, I suppose the most obvious one would be there would be a reduction in the number of special advisors, which would take effect from 2021. Um, and, you know, I think that uh, would um, potentially reduce the effectiveness of the administration. Um, you know, I think that would be the view of ministers, and it's not a view I would uh, dissent from at all. I think that would probably be the most immediate impact. The, the other issues um, are, as I described, they would uh, limit the discretion of ministers um, in certain areas and uh, uh, put certain obligations on them as well. So, you know, I think the, the concerns I articulated in relation to the first five clauses and clause 12 would be the, the concerns we would have here in the executive office. Thank you. Okay, Pat. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks for the information you've given us, David. Um, I just, uh, it's not a hard question. I suppose that the institutions here are, are unique on these islands, you know, in terms of the multi party coalition executive. Uh, having to deal with issues like the legacy of the conflict and, and, and so on. And uh, just picking up on, on Trevor's commentary about the criteria that should be used uh, to uh, pick a number of, of uh, special advisors, you know, is it population or, 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 or what other criteria should be used? And uh, would, would you agree that our situation here is much more complex than, say, Scotland or Wales? Uh, so, in, in, in that respect, there may be a need for actually more special advisors than either Wales or Scotland have. That argument could be made. No, certainly I, I would see that, that um, a, co a coalition with five parties in it, um, obviously, it's almost inherently more difficult to get things agreed, uh, and special advisors can play a very important role in helping to broker political agreements between parties behind the scenes. So, you know, I, I don't want to get into a debate from a civil service point of view as to what the right number is, but obviously the fewer you have, uh, then the, the less ability you have to perform those important functions. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, just staying on that same theme. I mean, I don't suppose, for example, that Robin Swan has any less work to do than Matt Hancock. Would you agree with that? Uh, I, I think that's actually a very neat way of summing up the challenge we have here. You know, dealing with the development of a policy for 1.9 billion people can be just as challenging as developing a policy for 55, 60 million people. Um, you know, the Belfast Trust is the largest health trust in, uh, in these islands. Um, so, uh, you know, the health minister has a very big portfolio and a very big challenging role, and he would have to cover all the areas that the health minister uh, would have to cover in the other jurisdictions. The difference is scale. But sometimes scale doesn't lessen the challenge when you've got a broad remit. Yeah, and you make the point well. I mean, it doesn't matter if you have to make a policy for 100,000 people or 50 million people. 
you still have to make the policy and it still yep. requires the same amount of, of, of work and expertise uh, to do that. Uh, and, you know, so when you look at all of our ministers, you know, <coughs> our Arlene and Michelle, any less busy than Nicola Sturgeon or the first minister in Wales? You know, the answer is clearly they're not. Uh, and, and particularly in the current context, they're definitely not. Uh, and, and given the context context of what we've spoken about there, about the difficulties, the unique difficulties that we face here, uh, never mind the fact that we've a land border with the EU after the, uh, the, we leave the EU uh, itself. So uh, all those, all those uh, issues sometimes are ignored and, and many of the detractors of the institutions here, and I'm not going to ask you to comment on this, and the proposer of this bill is one of the biggest detractors of all, and, and, and often talk about toy town uh, parliaments and so on. Uh, he, he, he's, he's been quite often on record with that quote, I think. Uh, actually, the, the people responsible here just do as much work uh, as ministers in any other institutions anywhere on these ends. But we'll leave that for a minute. I, I suppose, again, another general question. Uh, in your experience, and you've been around here a long time, do the special advisors in general play a positive role in the administration uh, here in the north? Yeah, you know, I, I, I've always been on record as saying special advisors have a very important role to play in helping the administration work smoothly. Uh, and repeating a point we both agreed on earlier, if you've got a five-party coalition, um, it's inherently more challenging to get agreement on difficult issues. And I think that's an area where special advisors have a very important role to play. Um, and you know, my experience in this current executive is people are generally working very well together, um, have faced up to the challenge of the pandemic, um, and have, uh, I think, achieved quite a lot um, in very, very difficult circumstances. Uh, and it's good to hear that parties are working together, but I suppose uh, that if it was one party in government, uh, like, for example, in Scotland, uh, all the ministers were from the one party and all the special advisors were from one party. It, it would make uh, the working of the government much, much easier uh, and much smoother. I'm sure you would agree with that. I, I, think, that's, I think that's right. Um, I think and certainly the experience of looking at other jurisdictions where you have a group of politicians um, who have got a strong mandate and a strong sense of common purpose uh, and a clear manifesto, yeah, it is easier to get things done. And that's absolutely right. Okay, thanks for that. Thanks, Tim. Okay, thank you very much. Next, we'll move on to Starleaf and to Martina. And I will start with my apologies. As I say, it wasn't a custard cream. I believe it was something else. So. Uh, <laughs> something much more elaborate than that. But yeah, um, Martina, if you want to go ahead there. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. I'm getting used to this yoke, I can tell you, I don't know how to mute. So that's part of the problem. I still don't know how to mute. So I got one bite out of my lunch, out of my business. I was tired. So uh, thank you, thank you, David, for, for the presentation and for walking us through uh, all of those different clauses. And I can co concur with everything that Pat um, has just said. And I think um, it would be no surprise to anyone to find out that in the one hand, what you've been able to demonstrate, how effective the SPADs are, how they work very well, how currently they are working well, but um, if there were, for instance, to be a reduction in that, well, the sole purpose, I believe, of a bill like this would be to reduce the effectiveness of the administration. That's your quote. And I think that the purpose of those who are uttering some concern about spans and way back in the day, many, many moons ago, uh, when there were two different parties in OFM, DFM, we never heard any utterance in relation to the numbers of SPADs. I think the important point, as you said, around policy development, it is what they do 
in terms of the development of those policies and how they demonstrate they're having a difference to people's lives. And I just looked through there uh, today just to familiarize myself with the scale of the work that, uh, that Michelle and Arlene are undertaking to coordinate when you consider COVID-19, Brexit, uh, no good Brexit, the All-Ireland Ministerial Council, the strategic policy, uh, equality, race relations, uh, the strategic investment board, uh, looking at urban villages, 40 community-led projects. The, um, the scale of that is absolutely breathtaking and a reduction of SPADs uh, to reduce the effectiveness of the administration, I think um, would, would be detrimental. And that might be some people don't want to see this administration being as effective as what it has been and can continue to be. One thing I would like to ask, Chair, and it's because SPADs, uh, the work they have been doing in taking a number of matters forward. And I recognise you may not be able to answer me, but because the clock is ticking and the time frame that I'm going to mention here is, is Friday, and therefore I would even appreciate, if you can't answer me now, to come back. It's The, the Executive Office has recently taken on um, the, the issue on, with regards to the gradual entry in medical school at McGee with the first uh, students going to an intake of students of 70 by September 2020. But it's just to find out what work is underway by the relevant departments um, because I know the clock is ticking. And if, we, and if I could have an update, Chair, different to this, uh, because I appreciate that's not uh, what you are here to discuss. But I believe my understanding is that the executive office in the coordination of that and i just want to demonstrate that this is another bit of work that has landed into the uh, the the joint first minister's office that they're taking forward and i believe a paper is to come before the executive on friday so that's why i wanted chair if with your indulgence to raise that even though i don't expect an answer other than to say that i concur with everything that pat and others have said about the sterling work that uh, the SPADs are doing, and really we do not want to reduce the effectiveness of the administration, as has been suggested here, would be the impact of this uh, this bill being taken forward and supported. Okay, I think with the for, first, first indulgence of a biscuit and the second indulgence of stretching beyond any means the capacity to ask a question. What I will do, David, is I'll ask you to come in at the end and answer the stuff about McGee, and maybe we'll just progress if there's anybody else on this theme, and then we'll come in at the end with that, if you're happy enough, David, for that. Um, and if we ask, maybe then... Uh, if we could, Emma, I, I, I'm afraid that the system has broke down insofar as I can't see on the screen in front of me anything, so I don't know if Emma maybe had any had her hand up that that wasn't uh, do you want to ask any questions i'll just check with you anyway emma hey can you hear me yeah yeah we can hear you yes all right okay. no i logged it for some reason it broke i don't know what happened and then when it let me back in it wouldn't let me mute and i see the wee button has activated again here no um i just i suppose following on from from some of the other questions that have came from the room i think it's just important to note the fact that david coming from the position that he does um with the expertise that he has doesn't see the merit in, in some of the in some of the clauses recommendations. Um, so I just I think that's interesting and it's an important to note if, if we're taking this bill on a, a merit basis and speaking to the experts and the people that are are working with SPAs and and know the sort of caseload that they have. Um, if if they're saying that there maybe isn't any any need to reduce the numbers uh, according to the to the bill, then that should be taken on board. So that's all. Okay, thank you. And then finally, we'll go to George. Um, George is on by phone on the system. George, do you have any questions or things you'd like to clarify? Um, just for clarification and just observations as well, Chair. Yes. Uh, and I thank uh, David for coming before the committee today. Um, as far as I'm concerned, um, I'm, an old, <laughs> I'm one of these people who believes in if it's not broke, don't fix it. And the two people in question, the First Minister and Deputy First Minister, surely, to goodness, they should know who they need, how many spads that they need. And in my opinion, and other people have mentioned the same thing, at the present time, uh, with the COVID-19 situation, I, I think they're doing a, a fabulous job. You know, 
the whole executive, and I do feel sorry to a certain extent for um, the the other the other ministers, well, particularly the health minister, because as David said, he is just the one, the one spot, and has he has enormous enormous work, you know, to do on a, on a weekly and a daily and weekly basis. But as as far as um, as far as everything's going, I I would be of the mind to leave things as they are, at the, at the, particularly at the present time. Because their their workload is is tremendous, you know, all the ministers and that executive in there. And my opinion, mind is to say, I'll repeat again, I think they're all doing a fabulous job and uh, leave well enough alone, uh, particularly at the present time. Anyway, that's my observation. Okay, th thank you, George. Maybe um, following on for that, because I suppose what, what I would want to be careful is that you know that it doesn't become a party political issue in so far as. You know, saying if other parties were in or other parties weren't in, we're twenty, nearly twenty-five years down the line from whenever we first put in the system of spads, and I suppose in essence, what we're saying is is reviewing that. In that vein, and following on probably from what George and others have referenced, do you think that if there was the same number of spads? But spread in a different way across departments to reflect maybe some of the changes, because it was said it was certainly discussed during the NDNA talks uh, and program for government conversations and others that just as George has said that the likes of the Department of Health is so big and has like nearly half the budget, but it has one spad, but yet another department that maybe has you know 50 for 59 million as a starting budget in the year has potentially eight within it, even though that they reach across other departments. Do you think that there is an opportunity for a review of how the SPADs are spread out, that there, if there wasn't a change in the number, but a change in the way that they were spread round? Well, that would obviously be a matter for ministers to discuss amongst themselves. Um, uh, I might offer the thought that if the health minister is listening in today, I'd be fully expecting him to be making a case for more spads for the Department of Health. So. And the junior minister. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just, I'm sure we all need to change the infrastructure, and you can guess where I'm coming from in that. No, I'm with you. But I've got to pass on. There's some more clarifications because we do have a little time left. So uh, I'm going to see maybe if we can pass on to, to Doug, and then we'll go to Trevor. And if anybody else wants to indicate, that's. David, I, I mean, I think this has been really useful. I mean, I think this has been really good, and I, and I appreciate everybody's comments here. And I've got to say, you, you're, you're extremely loyal, and, you know, and, 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 I, and I get that extremely loyal because everything is working really, really well, and, and what's not broke isn't, it doesn't need fixed. But are we forgetting what we just came from? <laughs> I mean, it, is, it was broken. It, it, you know, it was broken. And this is the whole point of this. This is why I'm looking for merit. Um, and you have to agree, and, and it is a question to you, yeah. that there was confidence damage over the last three years, and there's still confidence damage to what we have now. And there's an issue about transparency, and there's an issue about accountability. So whenever um, Christopher asked you, what is the benefits of this from um, Jim Alster? Well, maybe some of the benefits from this from Jim Alster is that it will put confidence, transparency, and accountability back into politics here in Northern Ireland. Is that not a fair thing to, 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 to say? Um, and, and I get what you're saying. Look, the executive's working really well now. Yes. And I remember the really good positive statement in December 2016, where it said it was working really, really well. And in January 2017, everything collapsed. So can you not see that one of the benefits of this could be confidence, transparency, and accountability? I, I fully recognise that um, there were issues around confidence, um, transparency, accountability. But what I've seen is ministers very determined to address those concerns. Um, and I think it was a point I made when I was discussing the draft bill at the Finance Committee, is I think the most important thing for a uh, smoothly functioning administration is actually trust between the various players and I think if you're purely reliant on um, legal sanctions to make something work then I think you're in trouble. Uh, I think if you have an administration where people have confidence and trust in each other and uh, are happy to be transparent about uh, not just when things are going well, but when things are going badly, then I think that's, that's the ideal. If you like, that's the sort of sweet spot you want. And at the moment, all I'm saying is that 
six months into a new administration uh, where you've got five parties working together. You've got several ministers who have not had ministerial portfolios before. Uh, I, I think the performance has been pretty good, particularly when you look at the scale of the challenge that has been faced. Um, so um, I, I, I was careful not to say the bill has no merits or the bill has lots of benefits. You know, all I wanted to say today was to highlight the implications or the impacts that we would foresee if it was enacted was <coughs> it one to five and twelve in the way it's currently drafted. Okay. Uh, thanks, David. And, and and all I'll say is the issue about sanctions is is not what I'm referring to here. Okay. I'm referring to what we're talking about today. And if I could just say the last thing, which I think is is probably the quote from today, is Martina Anderson saying that she doesn't know how to mute. Uh, which I think is just <laughs> absolutely perfect. <laughs> Yeah. Very brave to have brought that back <laughs> up again, Deputy Chair. <laughs> um, uh, moving quickly, Trevor, would you yeah. like to make a final point yeah, and then we'll bring you. ourselves to a close if we're... Still going back to the, the number of special advisors. Uh, am I right in thinking that currently the situation is that they're allowed to appoint up to three special advisors, but no more than that? Four. So if they wanted, four. Is it not up to four? Sorry, it was four, but they have agreed to junior ministers three, were four. Four. Okay, I'm with it here. They, they've agreed to go down to three. That's, that's fair enough. But there's no provision for them to increase the number of special advisors we stand at the moment. Now, I don't know if three, two, or one, or four is the right figure. That's, it really is for ministers to decide what, what level of input they need. But that, if, would, would it find more favour, perhaps, if... Let's say the figure was set at, at two, uh, but with a provision that if, if the oh, if, um, executive Sorry, office wanted to appoint another special advisor, that they could do so with the consent of the House. They would have to bring it to the House. It, what's in the bill or proposed bill at the moment is very firm. It's three down to one, no concessions. One, one wouldn't work out, two might. Quite, quite possible that either our minister might might not be able to work with two, might need three. But with with the with the draft order through the House, effectively they're allowed to happen. Well, I, th I think ministers might say in such circumstances that that was the legislature interfering in the smooth running of the uh, administration or the executive. Um, you know, uh, it, it's... That, 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 that somebody mentioned confidence a few months ago. That would perhaps give the rest of us confidence that they they couldn't, frankly, get away with increasing the size of their empires without consultation with the House and explanation as to why they might need another person. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the record shows that um, when ministers came back in January, First Minister, Deputy First Minister, did think very carefully about this and did conclude that reducing to three was the right thing to do and you know I think you have to give them some discretion uh, when it comes to I think dealing with the very difficult portfolios that they have. Absolutely, I think there might have been a degree of uh, pressure or outrage at the suggestion that they needed four each which might have contributed some way to the reassessment that perhaps they could make do with three. Interesting observation. <laughs> I think, Chair, a, a provision like that, whereby if you needed to appoint an additional special advisor, in, r rather than enhancing the confidence of the public in these institutions, I think an unholy row on the floor of the Assembly about the appointment of another staff, I just I, I don't think that, that would work. I also think probably employment law issues around that, in terms of do you source the person, you know, does the House get the name of the person, and do you then end up with the a debate about the character of the person, I, I, I would be very nervous about uh, going down that sort of route. Be, sorry, Chair. It would be, it would be, such a debate would be based on the principle of whether or not they could justify needing another special advisor. So the name you, of the character or personality would have nothing to do with it. Right, so you're suggesting the House, through the Chair, mm -hmm. you're suggesting a mechanism whereby the House approves the appointment or the creation of a post rather than the appointment of a person. Oh yes, yes, yes. Right, okay. Now, the, the other thing about special responsibility, special circumstances, 
you might be looking at a particular person, obviously you would, but that's, that's outside of the normal appointments process anyway. I'm kind of not detecting very many questions of our guests no. here, so I suspect we've strayed into the conversations that we'll be having at a point in time anyway no. uh, when discussing these, um, these, these clauses. Um, maybe at that point I'll, I'll bring us to close in, in the absence of any other questions, and thank you both for coming yeah. along. Um, oh, Martina, you're looking... Yeah, Martina... Mc Mc oh. A question on McGee. Oh, yes, sorry, um, of course, yeah. yeah. Uh, some indication of that. And just to let them know, it's my computer, I can't move, sure you wouldn't want me to it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Obviously, we do have a letter later in our correspondence pact relating uh, from the Economy Committee, uh, which has written asking for um, that update on the issue of McGee, which has obviously moved to you know, from, from health and economy has moved to um, the executive office. So could you give us an update as to where we are? Because there are some impending dates, some cliff edge yeah, dates the, there that, the, that need to be addressed. The executive, obviously, it's a matter of public record. The executive recently re reaffirmed its commitment to establishing a graduate entry medical school at McGee in line with new decade, new approach. So uh, there's a bit of work being done across a number of departments. And that work is progressing well. So we'll be providing an update to the executive shortly. And is work progressing well mean that you're likely to meet the deadlines that are required to have it up and running by this September, October? Uh, well, it wouldn't be this September, it would be 21. 21, sorry. Um, <clears throat> certainly that's the intention. Okay. Martina, are you happy enough for... Well, ha happy enough that at least that I know that the work is being progressed and just that I believe part of that work, Chair, um, needs to involve um, some indication given to the executive by the 12th, which is Friday, so there's an executive meeting on Thursday. So it would to get a handle on whether the departments have been coordinated in the way to allow that report to go to the executive so that it is all going towards that date of the 70th uh, intake for next year, but there's time that is required so that students know that that offering is in place. And that's crucially important to know that maybe something will be going to the executive tomorrow uh, because there's a deadline for Friday. Are you at liberty to tell us what's well, on the advance agenda? I'm I sure think, the junior, former right. junior ministry I'm knows that that can't be done, but anyway, we'll try. We need to check, but I think things are on track. So we on track. Well, we'll take you on your word of it being on track as being uh, an indication. Um, David, thank you very much. And Neil, thank you very much for um, uh, coming along here today. Um, I suppose I, what could be an interesting litmus test would be if, um, if, if, if the, re the retirement did happen in August, if we brought you back and asked you the same questions in September um, with the freedom to answer, because I would feel that a lot of the answers were exceptionally positive, And I don't think you'll have any kitchens that you'll be getting the round of whenever you go back down to the executive office from SPADS anyway. But thank you very much indeed for your attendance here today. It's been much appreciated. Thank, thank, you. Sure. thank you. Thank you. Have to fight. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we could get you back up again. <laughs> Okay, uh, members, thank you very much. We can. There was a, there's a lot of people. Uh, yeah. uh, that's it. Uh, okay, it's 14. 14. Okay, so members, just in conclusion for that section, there was a list of suggested questions that are contained within. Uh, the pack. Would members be happy and um, content if we send those on for written uh, update just to assist the clerk in, in, in giving us the information for putting together the report at the end? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. so we have that agreement there. Um, okay, so folks, we can move on then to uh, page 61, which is the forward work programme. So it is um, we have next week, we have the bill sponsor coming to give us a further, uh, or to give us another update, and we will have our question and answers on um, the bill for that for next week. Um, the following week, we have, uh, we can give consideration to our response uh, based on the bill, uh, but we also have 
um, an evidence session from the junior ministers in regard to Brexit. Um, I'm also going to make a suggestion that prior to that meeting, which normally starts at two, that if we asked Shauna uh, to come along, the EU Affairs um, Officer, to come along and meet us at 1.30 to maybe help guide us through what the recent updates have been to that stage and then might help and assist us in preparing some questions to address the junior ministers with at that point. So we'll offer that out to people at that stage on the 24th. Um, on the 1st of July, we will agree our committee response to the functioning of government bill, um, and we will then have first and deputy first minister who have agreed to attend at that stage to give us a further update on the COVID pandemic. At this stage, I would suggest that we have one further meeting on the 8th of July, uh, which, having attended the business committee yesterday, uh, I think would be envisaged as the. Uh, end of the opportunity for us to say let's plan, let's focus in, let's put uh, definitive uh, items onto an agenda. But we will leave ourselves the opportunity after that, that if we do need to meet for any issue that we can always uh, come together uh, and we can have meetings if we need to get uh, any briefings on any issues. But we do need to respect the fact that the committee staff um, who have worked every single week from we've come back uh, do require to take some leave, and I think it's important that we give them that opportunity because we will want to come back again uh, in September. But I think there's plenty of work there for us to be doing in the background over the summer period, anyway, in terms of reading and preparing uh, for uh, September time. But we do have the opportunity, if we wanted to get together for an issue for a briefing that wouldn't require uh, input from the committee clerks, because obviously the papers, etc., that are put together, there's a three or four days' worth of work in preparation for a committee meeting. And if we were to continue to meet right throughout July and August, it would mean that our staff would get no leave. So, yes, could I just say on that, Chair, I, I agree. And I think if, if we need to meet you know, in that, uh, sure. during recess, I think it's disgraceful that there are parties that have been taken to the airwaves, knowing full well that the people who work in this building and the administration of this building are contractually obliged to take their holidays during July and August. And they know that. Uh, it's like teachers. They have to take their holidays under contract during certain times of the year. So it's not, you know, it's not a question of you know, lazy people not wanting to do their work. It's, it's the law. It's the contract that they've signed. I think it's really important that people understand that in terms of the, the contribution that the people that work and there is committee clerks or the general administration of the assembly are making that those who are running to the airwaves and commenting about, you know, oh, we shouldn't be taking a recess and all that sort of stuff. If it was up to me, I'd be happy to, to turn up throughout the summer months. But it's other people who are put out by that in terms of their contractual obligations. And I think it's important to say that. Yeah, well, certainly, uh, Trevor. Uh, no, not, not that particular point. Oh, well, maybe just in, in, in completing that point, I mean, I, I agree, and I think we should give uh, cognizance right throughout the, the entire building to the, the term recess, because people seem to have the concept that recess means that we all go off on two months' holidays, but actually it's not. It's actually a, an opportunity for two months for MLAs to get back into their constituencies, and I know certainly at the minute I manage one day a week in the constituency because I'm here four days a week. Uh, regularly with committee business and the opportunity means that you spill into Saturdays and Sundays and evenings and you don't mind doing that because you've got the summer time to be able to catch up with the work and, and provide cover while your staff go from the constituency office on leave as well and you can maintain a presence in the constituency um, and I like to be able to provide like others I'm sure every member here you like to provide that service right throughout the whole year uh, and recess does not equal going off for two months holidays and lounging around. That's certainly not what happens in, in our places. Trevor, you were looking in on another issue. It's just uh, still on the forward work programme, Chair. Um, we have, you have listed for the next three weeks um, more discussion around what we've discussed today. Uh, fair enough. Um, it's only half three and we, we've, we, could, we could be here longer than this. And I noticed that the uh, victims' payment scheme Oral evidence and the historical institutional abuse mm -hmm. is is both listed as to be scheduled 
could, could we not fit one or both of them in between now and the 1st of July and, and have a session with them after we've dealt further with the, yep. the, what, what we've been talking about today? And I think you find that they do double up. Next week's an exception, but after that, there's two things that are in each week. We've got the First and Deputy mm. First Minister one week, and we've the Junior Ministers another week as well as the considerations. Yeah. Uh, so, But next week, you're right, there is, is a gap there, but I think we had a... Okay, we can request the evidence sessions. We can't make the people come no. on the days we want. The victim payment scheme has been requested. Um, officials have to get clearance from ministers um, to appear before the committee. Um, the Historical Institution of Abuse, the committee had agreed that uh, we the, the one in relation to Kostika, af obviously after, after Kostika is appointed, the other one in relation to the institutions, the committee had agreed to leave it. Um, a period of time so that once uh, officials came they had something substantial to say because mm -hmm. those discussions are only starting but I mean if there's any other or if you want to push for any of those I I'm quite happy to go back yeah. to the department or if I'm there's just, any I'm just thinking of uh, frankly public perception here mm -hmm. there, there's a lot of unease goes beyond unease out there around the way that the victims payment scheme in particular has been handled mm -hmm. and the constant delays and now the prospect of more delay yeah. And we, as the committee directly responsible, won't be discussing it. But, uh, I think we could do better than that. Okay. Are there any other views on that matter? Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I think there is a fair degree that the victims' payment scheme, we, we cannot go off on any form of a recess, whatever, without trying to do something in regards to this, Thank because you. that just knocks it back by another three months. Um, I think if we can push for the victim payment scheme or an evidence before, yeah. um, I, I think that's certainly one of them. The historical institutional abuse, I think there's good reasons why we delay on that a little bit, I get that. Um, but the victim's payment scheme, I don't think we can in this particular yeah. case. Mm -hmm. Gary, if you indulge me again, we could, from what I read of what the Speaker's advice is for July and August, he intends to uh, leave the rest of July open, certainly for the Ad Hoc Committee uh, on, on COVID-19. That's correct. So that, that would, yeah, so that would indicate to me that we're, we're all sort of on standby anyway through July. On the basis all our holidays have been cancelled anyway, and uh, it, it, we could perhaps schedule uh, an extra meeting of this committee, just purely to try and push that forward. Okay, yes, Pat. Uh, I have no disagreement with that at all. I mean, my my understanding was that you know we're working right through July, and there's a three week uh, uh, break in August. I don't think there's unless no. there's there's something urgent arises and we can be called back yeah. basically at any time. So you know, effectively, we're not stopping at all. But just on the issue of the victims payment uh, scheme, who who is it we would be asking to come in? It, we had asked just for officials from the department. From the department, yeah, yeah. Is there anybody else you want to ask in? No, sure. We can push for the officials. Yeah, I, I think, I think of whoever the officials are, I think all we need to know and we need to understand is the clarity about the, the, the difficulties, you know, all of the mm. difficulties, because, you know, it's our job to scrutinise, so therefore we just need to know the problems yeah. so that we can look at this, you know, regardless of mm -hmm. the stance, just so we can look at it. So, maybe if we opted for that week of the 8th of July for the victims' service, our victims' payments, that gives a substantial amount of time for the department to okay somebody coming up this versus next Wednesday, which is the where there is a space. Next Wednesday's maybe we're only going to set ourselves up for a fall. We can go Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or Thursday, Friday, and ask those people to come up, and then it gets declined. And then next Wednesday, we've only got uh, we we wouldn't we would have missed that chance that if we give them now the eighth of July, we're giving them practically a full month to be able to say that they can send somebody up to give us a briefing on that. Um, and then the 24th and the 24th of June and the 1st of July are filled up with two sets of uh, presentations. And, you know, there's a substantial programme for that. Um, if we did get the victims payments scheme by on, in on the eighth, we could get something else in alongside that that day and that would give us two presentations on the 8th of July and that's bringing us up towards the middle uh, of the month and we can assess from there. 
Um, I am again just conscious that staff do need the time off. They have a considerable amount of leave that has been accrued from, from we returned back in July. But that's notwithstanding that if we were willing to get some oral briefings, we could certainly arrange those and we could manage them without um, some, um, you know, if it was just a case of somebody coming in and presenting in a quest and answer and there wasn't background papers that were required of any depth, we could nearly manage our own way through that for, for a, a meeting or two. But will we see where that takes us to with, with that? Okay. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, right, members, then we can thank you for that. We can move on to correspondence um, item which is number six on the agenda. There are nine items of correspondence and one in the tabled pack. Uh, just to draw your attention to a couple of them, uh, item 6.2 and 71 is a response providing the estimated costings for the HIA redress panel over the six year panel. Uh, in the request for information, the committee highlighted the urgent need to fill the vacant staff positions within the interim advocate's office to allow him to carry out his work without any impediment. Now, this response tells us that there are four staff. Um, the interim advocate staff chart showed us that there should be six uh, in place, plus legal policy and PR help. So, with your um, approval, can we seek some clarity just on the positions that are empty on the basis that um, if the commissioner is in place by late summer, that they maybe will be returning to a full staff team? Uh, that would be present rather than there just seems to be an anomaly between there being four people in place but the, when we got our presentation at the start of the year it said that the organisation had six staff Would can we get agreement um, yep. to do that um, item 6.5 on page 90 is a correspondence from the committee economy to the first and deputy first minister regarding the graduate school at McGee and we've circumnavigated that by actually getting the answer here or a, a comment on that today um, but maybe just to seek that we as a committee contact the First and Deputy First Minister and ask to get a copy of that reply to that letter so that we know where we are. Would members agree with that? Yep. Okay. Um, item 6.7 uh, is correspondence from the EU Affairs Manager providing a link to the House of Lords EU Committee report, um, the protocol in Ireland, Northern Ireland, which was published on the 1st of June. The report includes information which was gathered during the EU Committee's visit to Belfast on the 25th of February, when Lord Canal as chair of the committee is keen to follow up engagement that it had with the Assembly in February. Um, some of the members that are present here also met with them. So um, I would ask members if they would appreciate a virtual session with the Lords Committee to discuss the content of the report, which included uh, inclusions from ourselves. Would members be agreeable to that? Now that we've got our technology, we can do these things without having to travel. Um, item 6.10 uh, is correspondence from the Executive Office providing a copy of the press release announcing the launch of the completion, uh, competition sorry, for the Commissioner of Survivors of Institutional Childhood Abuse. Um, this Commissioner will have the full range of statutory powers uh, that will be required, I believe, to uh, adequately work with the whole of the sector. So therefore, I mean, we've been pushing for this as a committee right from our first meeting uh, back uh, at the end of January. And I suppose it would be amiss of us not to welcome the fact that it has progressed to that public appointment system. We know that it was delayed by a number of weeks due uh, to coronavirus, uh, which is entirely understandable. But we had all made representations, and, and I know certainly as chair that I had raised it at the two meetings that I had with First and Deputy First Minister, so it's very welcome um, that that has progressed to where it is. Um, and there's, that's my lot on the correspondence. Um, Doug? Just, just a quick one, Chair. I think in, in 6.1, it's, it's, it's worthwhile noting um, uh, David Sterling's response. Remember, we asked him the question had he known? that yeah. uh, Mr. Brendan McAllister was engaged in the course to become a deacon in the Catholic Church, um, if he would have seen that as a conflict of interest, and, and he has said yes, um, he would have seen it as a conflict of interest, and, and he's absolutely right. It doesn't help now whatsoever, and that's not the issue, but, but I suppose it's worth acknowledging it because those who at the time from some of the groups um, uh, who, who represent those who suffered from historical institutional abuse who said it was a conflict of interest, I, I, I guess, you know, I mean, this helps them that, that 
what they were saying wasn't wrong in many ways. So I just thought I'd highlight that. Okay. Well, folks, then we move on to item seven, Chairman's business. I'm happy enough that I've covered everything at this stage that um, I need to. Uh, item eight, any other business? Okay, then the date, time and place of our next meeting is next Wednesday, not here, but maybe next door, or it could be here. We keep that surprise until the <laughs> day before the meeting. So thank you very much for those that have joined by Starleaf, and thank you very much for those in attendance today. Thank you. Thank you. Nine. Okay, thank you very much, members. We're just coming back for after a short suspension there, and there is just one issue that we want to tie up before we go. Um, just refers to the letter that we had received from the Executive Office from David Sterling and references to the query regarding uh, whether or not he would have considered the appointment of the interim advocate, um, whether or not if he had knowledge about the uh, further involvement of himself as a deacon would have been considered uh, a conflict of interest. Um, I think I would recognise that maybe some of the remarks that members have passed uh, may have interpreted the letter incorrectly. Um, there is quite an, over an overuse, uh, an over-exuberance of commas, um, which maybe does lead to the, uh, the potential for misinterpreting what is in it. But I think it would be fair to say that Mr Sterling is suggesting that um, the premise of the question that we asked as a committee uh, was a hypothetical situation that he felt answering uh, would not have been uh, to anybody's benefit and that certainly he wasn't accepting the premise that there was a conflict of interest, which we may have uh, heard earlier. So I'm just going to ask Doug if you wanted to come in there. Yeah, no, listen, um, Chair, I, I mean, it's purely my misreading of it. Um, and you're absolutely right. And I just want to put that on record uh, that he hasn't said that at all. In, in fact, he said that it's not helpful answering that hypothetical question. So uh, it was purely my misreading of it. And, and, and if I've animated anything else, then and I think I've just got that bit wrong. So yeah. no issue. OK, well, I think it's just important to, to, for us to set that straight while we're in the room. And then uh, on the basis of that, if there's no other business, we're happy enough to conclude. And we meet again at this time next week. Thank you very much indeed, members. Thank, Thank you. you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 12.30.